Before we begin any work on the top side of the motor for the water pump assembly, we need to remove this air intake dam. And how we do that is removing the pop rivets here, here, and here. Using a flat bladed screwdriver, just gently pry it underneath the center of the pop rivet to release it from the vehicle. And you want to be delicate here because these plastic pieces on the, these BMWs are very fragile and extremely expensive if you decide to break them. <clears throat> Remove the air dam assembly by gently rocking it back and forth until it frees itself from the air intake box snorkel assembly as such. Remove the air intake box assembly by undoing the two 10 millimeter bolts here, disconnecting the mass airflow sensor wiring harness, and then undoing the hose clamp using a flathead bladed screwdriver. The reason why we want to remove this air box is just to give us more clearance on the engine bay area so we have more room to work with. Undo the electrical connector by pressing down on the metal tab and then gently pulling the wire away and then using your flat bladed screwdriver, loosen the hose clamp assembly as such. Once everything has been loosened, you can gently pick up the air box assembly and ever so carefully disconnect the hose from the intake track and then lift the box up in a manner as such, like this, to remove the lower air snorkel. On the back side of the box, you may find that there are uh, wiring harnesses hooked onto the air box assembly via some grommets. You'll just have to use a flat blade screwdriver to gently undo them, such as this big, large one here. And then once you lift up the box, it should look like this. The next step here is to remove the uh, cooling fan assembly off of this manual transmission BMW. Now, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which vehicle you own, uh, the manual transmission version is actually easier to work on because the fan assembly is electric and it's simply removed by removing the pop rivet here where the radiator fill cap is, disconnecting the two wire harness connectors on the left side, and then undoing the Torx T25 bolt on the left upper portion of the of the fan and the entire assembly lifts out. If you have a automatic version of this vehicle, um, unfortunately you're going to have to invest in a 32 millimeter, um, a 32 millimeter water pump uh, center shaft holding wrench. It's a thin profile one if you can see it here. And then you're also going to need to invest in a special pulley holding tool here that will prevent the water pump pulley from turning while you undo the fan. Um, I can't demonstrate it here on this vehicle because it doesn't have a fan clutch. But on the automatic version, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to put jam the center pulley from spinning and then you're going to turn the wrench in a clockwise rotation to undo the fan clutch. Um, I'm not going to cover the details here because I can't show it to you guys. Undo the right side pop rivet using a flat blade screwdriver and a pair of needle nose pliers. Gently pull it out. Disconnect the fan wiring harness by pressing on the side tabs as such and then lifting up. Remove the fan control relay box by pulling this way and up to completely remove it off the fan shroud assembly. If you don't have enough clearance, you can just simply push on this tab here to disconnect this connector and then ever so carefully remove this box. Now here's what the bottom of this box looks like. Uh, to unhook it, you might have to even reach your fingernails underneath this bracket assembly here to push those tabs out. This large harness here will loop through the shroud of the radiator fan below, and I can't know if you how well you can see it in this video, but you need to essentially unhook it from the shroud assembly so that it doesn't get caught on the fan when you're removing it from the vehicle. And this can be done by simply pushing the wire around the tab hook so that it moves freely in this manner as such. Using a T25 Torx bit, remove the upper radiator fan retaining screw. Remember, all these parts here are plastic, so you need to take extra care not to do any damage as they are quite delicate. In the center of the radiator fan shroud assembly is a little hook 
So to remove the fan, we essentially just lift straight up onto the fan assembly and remove the radiator fan from the vehicle. In order for us to remove the drive belts off of the vehicle, we need to expose the tensioner uh, torx bolt located underneath these tusk caps on the lower tensioner here, which is what holds the alternate or the air conditioning belt from the center pulley to the AC compressor. And then on this side, the alternator and power steering belt uh, pulley can be exposed via this cover right here. And you just simply pop this cover off, exposing that center bolt for the tensioner here. The next step here is to remove the most forward belt on the drive pulley system, which is going to be the AC compressor belt. Using your Torx, Torx uh, T50 uh, bit, squarely insert this bit into that tensioner where you exposed the cap earlier to just gently and ever so carefully, and you don't want this Torx bit to slip because you'll strip the Torx head, is to push down or rotate the tensioner in a clockwise manner to relieve the tension and then gently release it to remove the uh, AC belt. The next step is to remove the alternator um, drive belt as well. And doing the same thing, make sure that your bit is planted nice and firmly and deeply into that bolt. And then just applying a gentle steady pressure, slide the belt off of the tensioner and carefully release. The tensioner bolts, because of their nature of being a Torx bit, uh, can be quite fragile, so you want to make sure that you don't strip those bolts, otherwise uh, you're going to have to find a replacement. A good service tip here is to make sure that you do pay careful attention to the routing of the belts, as once you lose that routing schema, it can be rather confusing to reinstall those belts. I'm going to now remove the water pump uh, pulley assembly located right here. Um, there are four 10 millimeter screws holding it onto the hub and I mean you can either hold the pulley by hand to undo them as how I'm doing them now um, and as they shouldn't be very tight to begin with. So I'll just loosen the four screws and I'm going to undo them as such and that's what they look like. Gently wiggle the pulley assembly to pull it off the water pump hub. Here's another service tip that you can use if your water pump pulley won't come off of the hub of the water pump. Is that looking directly in front of the oil filter assembly right here. You can actually see directly down to the line of where the water pump is. And you can actually take a flat bladed screwdriver and ever so carefully stick it between the pulley and the, the old water pump assembly and just give it a gentle twist. And remember, these pieces are plastic, so they will break very easily or mar the surface. In this case, I just had to pry very slightly on the back side, and that just came right off. Undo the lower engine uh, wind deflector splash cover by undoing the various Phillips screws located alongside the uh, edges of the lower cover. If need be, raise the vehicle. In this particular case, I'm able to undo all the screws without actually raising the car. This is what the engine cover looks like when it's been removed from the vehicle. This is the actual bottom side of it, and of course, that's actually the side that the engine bay, but this is the ground side. So, there's actually seven screws that need to be undone with a Phillips screwdriver. One, two, three, four, along the side front edges, front of the vehicles right here. And then, the jack point on the vehicle in the middle, there's a Phillips screw directly behind that, as well as a Phillips screw to the left and to the right. Use a suitable size drain pan, such as this one below, that can hold at least 10 or more liters of fluid. Before we begin disassembling any component out of the cooling system, we need to make sure that we devoid the cooling system of coolant. And one of the easiest ways to do so is to locate the lower radiator drain petcock valve, which is located on the driver's side of the radiator, once you remove the lower engine cover. And, uh, this large one here is the actual radiator drain petcock, and the blue one over there in the distance is the uh, uh, is the reserve tank drain. And basically, what we're going to do is that we're going to undo both of those 
to their maximum limit of travel or just remove them completely if possible depending on your radiator um, to let all the coolant out and basically once the coolant's been removed from the system we can just simply replace the drain caps back on and instead of using a screwdriver to actually undo the drains we're actually going to use a dime and the reason why is if you look at the way the groove channels are on the drain plugs um, we want to get the maximum contact surface area to open it up and the best way to do it is to use a coin because it sits nice and snug in that notch um, if you can't turn the coin by hand you can just simply turn the coin with a pair of pliers and those plugs will surely budge this is what that radiator drain looks like when it's been removed now that drain that I had showed you in the video earlier that's more towards the back side is actually the coolant reservoir as well as the coolant line drain plug and that one doesn't actually come out it just kind of dangles because it has a little uh, tether uh, on the end of it now in order for us to speed up the drainage process uh, we need to introduce some air into the system which we can do by removing or loosening the radiator cap open the upper radiator cap to introduce air into the cooling system Once all the coolant has drained out of the radiator as well as the reserve tank and the coolant lines, replace the radiator cap temporarily just to prevent any foreign objects from falling into the reserve tank and we'll begin to remove the water pump assembly from the engine. The water pump assembly is held on with four 10 millimeter nuts um, onto some bolted studs and basically all we need to do is just take our trusty ratchet here and then begin undoing the uh, water pump bolts or sorry the water pump nuts not bolts guys um, just make sure that you have a suitable drain pan again underneath the vehicle to capture any coolant that's going to come out of the engine block so I just had to apply just a little bit of force to undo these nuts so it just highlights to you how loose they really can be on this car these are the 10 millimeter nuts that I just pulled off of the water pump Carefully grab the center hub assembly of the water pump and just gently give it a wiggle and the water pump should just come out of the engine. Now, if it's being a little bit stubborn and not wanting to come off, um, just be aware that depending on the mileage of your vehicle as well as the heat cycling on this pump that it has to endure from this engine running, that it can be a little bit of a challenge to, uh, to pull it out. My advice is to not use any tools to pry anything out because like anything on this BMW engine, it is a, a precision machine and you don't want to damage any of the mating surfaces um, that are used to, uh, to seal things like oil and, and water and what have you. After a couple of minutes of persistent tugging on this hub, I was able to uh, pull the water pump assembly right out of the bore. And this is what it looks like once it's been removed. Since we're replacing the water pump, you know, at 100,000 kilometers, uh, we might as well take the time to go ahead and also replace the thermostat assembly uh, at the same time, which is located right here. And the reason why is um, you're going to all this work to go ahead and change the water pump assembly on the vehicle, and then what's going to happen is, you know, you're going to put in you're going to put in a new water pump and then find out that the thermostat either stuck closed or stays stuck open causing either an overheat or no heat condition and really you know for the amount of effort it takes to replace it it should be done at the same time so to remove the thermostat housing and thermostat assembly we're going to want to cut this tire up here that's retaining this cable to the upper portion of the thermostat housing and then we're also going to use our uh, we're going to push down on this pin connector here to disconnect the sensing assembly and then basically lift this wire assembly just out of the way a little bit if you can. And then to disconnect the hoses we're going to use our flat bladed screwdriver and we're going to basically pry into the grooves of these uh, lock rings on the cooling line to loosen up the hose assemblies here and here. They don't need to come completely off, they just need to come up. And then from there, we can go ahead and just simply slide this off as such, fold that back. We can slide the lower hole up ever so carefully. Now again, just be aware guys that these are plastic components so you don't want to damage it by forcing anything. 
So this is what a new thermostat and thermostat housing assembly looks like. It's got a new gasket there along the perimeter um, and as you can tell uh, it's held in with four uh, screws or bolts which are have they have a 10 millimeter head on them so in the BMW world the temperature sender as well as the thermostat assembly here is all one piece um, if I remember correctly this was like hundred and seventy five dollars at BMW Canada so it was a quite a pricey piece and again it's all made out of plastic so be careful when you're handling the old and new parts guys I just wanted to make one thing clear that I had mentioned earlier in my video that's slightly inaccurate I would mentioned that the thermostat housing assembly is held in with four screws um, all of them being 10 millimeter which is not entirely true these three bolts holes here are actually the 10 millimeter screws but this upper one here is in fact a 13 millimeter bolt that uh, has to actually pass through this engine hanging bracket piece um, and then through the thermostat housing so in order for us to actually remove this properly we actually have to use an 11 millimeter socket to take off this nut 13 millimeter socket to undo this screw which then this piece will lift out and then we can pull that assembly out from the motor this is what all the screws look like once it's been removed. Prior to reinstallation of any component onto any vehicle, we always want to make sure that we coat any screws that will be screwing into any metal components such as water pump nuts and bolts and what have you uh, with a liberal amount of this Permatex anti-seize compound. And The reason why we want to use this is that it prevents threads from galling and seizing up uh, in uh, in the thread bores and also to protect the screws from any internal thread corrosion which could also cause a seized bolt condition. Before we reinstall the water pump and the thermostat housing assembly we want to make sure that the mating surfaces of where we're putting everything back together is nice and clean and free of any hard water minerals or any leftover gasket material or soil or dirt or whatever it might be um, so that we have a nice tight clean seal. We also want to pay particular attention to inside these hose assemblies and making sure that we don't drop any dirt into the pipes and to make sure that they are nice and clean as well um, so that we don't contaminate the cooling system. Pay very close attention to soil that does fall into the pipes and if you have to use some plain tap water to flush the hose ends out then so be it. On this particular vehicle the inside of the hoses are nice and clean so I don't need to worry too too much about them. Um, so let's go ahead and do the reinstall. Once you've aligned your thermostat housing into place, loosely install all these screws back onto the engine block in a loose but even manner, if that makes any sense. What happens is that we just want to get our sort of baseline alignment in place perfectly before we start actually torquing down everything. Um, and this allows for any adjustments you know, in placement and to make sure that the fit is nice and snug. Using your ratchet, carefully tighten down the screws in a crisscross manner on the thermostat housing. Remember, these screws weren't very tight to begin with when we removed them, so they don't need to be overly tight when you reinstall them back. Basically, the amount of tightness that needs to be performed on this is essentially just snug and a little bit more. Remember, the pieces are made out of plastic and you risk cracking them if you over torque them. And it's also technically a little bit easier to re-tighten these screws down should a minor leak develop than to over tighten and break or strip things. We can now proceed to reattach the coolant hoses as such and they just simply go on by pressing on and then we re-enable the hose lock tabs back on. Now be aware guys that when you're reinstalling these hoses that there's actually a centering uh, tab here so that these couplings don't go on crooked. So just make sure that you pay attention to that before you snap those back in. And then everything, once everything's been locked in, you can just give these hoses a twist to make sure that they don't move. And then we can then go ahead and reconnect the coolant sensor plug back onto the thermostat housing. And then just get a new black tie wrap to tie this uh, piece back on. Next, prior to reinstalling the water pump, let's take a little bit of our anti-seize compound and just coat the threads of the water pump studs so that 
the threads or the nuts will go back on easier and also prevent galling and future seizing and corrosion. Let's reinstall the water pump. Now for those that don't know which orientation the new pump should go in, all you have to do is make sure that this bottom piece right here is pointing down to the floor and we'll just line them up on the studs and then just ever so carefully wiggle this piece on. To help ease installation you can always take a little bit of fresh coolant and just rub this gasket down so that it's wet and easier to slide into the uh, water pump bore. Let's give it a firm push and it should just lock right into place. Reinstall the four retaining nuts. And initially what we want to do is we just want to tie, tighten these down hand tight with our fingers first. And then using our 10 millimeter ratchet, we will tighten them down in an even crisscross manner paying special attention not to over tighten these nuts again. Now the reason why we want to tighten these down in a crisscross manner is that you want to make sure that you torque down your components on your vehicle evenly. I had mentioned earlier that the mating surfaces of these things are quite precise so we want to make sure that we don't do any warpage to the water pump uh, housing or to the face of the water pump flange so that's why we do this. So. There wasn't much tension needed to pull this pump off, so there shouldn't be a lot of tension to put this back on. Just be aware of that. Hand tight is all you need. Prior to the reinstallation of the water pump pulley, now is a good time to give everything a quick wipe down with a towel to make sure that any coolant that spilled onto the main crankshaft pulley is nice and dry. Otherwise, you're going to get a squealing belt until everything cools off. And it just leads to a tidier install process. It's good practice to have a clean engine bay and what have you. We'll now go ahead and reinstall the uh, water pump pulley and before we do so we just want to clean all the corrosion and dirt off the back side of this pulley so that it sits nice and flush against the uh, water pump uh, drive hub. So uh, the other thing that we want to do here is we want to inspect this pulley to make sure that there's no chips and cracks and what have you on this. Um, just because if there is, then you need to order a replacement right away. Let's reinstall the water pump pulley using your screws that are coated in anti-seize compound. Because I mentioned earlier that we are screwing metal into metal, so we want to make sure that if we ever have to service this water pump in the future, that it's going to be fairly easy to do. Now, it is worth mentioning as a service tip, guys, that the bolt pattern on this pulley is actually, it is symmetrical, but you need to make sure you pay attention um, to um, the bolt pattern because what I found on this vehicle is that there's a slight offset on them. So if you're wondering why you can't get the screws into the water pump hub, it's because you need to pay attention to how the screw patterns uh, are set up. The easiest way you can tell is if you screw them in in a sequential order in whatever direction you choose, it doesn't go in and starts threading in then odds are you probably don't have the holes lined up so now that we've got this all screwed in by hand let's just use our 10 mil ratchet and just snug down all these screws as such now again like all things on a BMW pieces are made from plastic so just slight hand tight is all you'll need there is a crushing lock washer underneath these 10 millimeter bolts, so odds are nothing's going to come loose. Like I said, just snug. Don't want to break anything. Okay, so now that we've buttoned up the cooling system back together, uh, we need to make sure that we fill, completely fill the cooling system with the proper amount of antifreeze. And so how I'm going to do this is I've got a bottle of distilled water here uh, inside this clear bottle and I've dumped out about half of it, more than half. So it's a 4 litre jug, I've got about maybe 1.8 litres, give or take. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take my BMW um, 
antifreeze here and I'm going to basically fill it so that I have a 60-40 uh, coolant mix um, inside my jug here and so it's a fairly straightforward process some people like to do exact precise measurements um, I like to make it this keep it the simple and easy way just by mixing it in this manner and then giving it a good shake and then using my coolant density meter, I can uh, check the freeze and boil point of this coolant fairly easily. So what I'm going to do here is put the cap on and then give this entire mixture a good solid shaking so that it's thoroughly mixed with my water. And then I'm going to use my trusty coolant density gauge right here, this Prestone device. I'm going to check the freeze and boil point. Now whenever you're using these gauges, you need to make sure that the coolant level actually comes up to the line right here on the, uh, on the gauging assembly. Otherwise it will give you an inaccurate reading. So mine is exactly at that line and it shows that my freeze and boil point is off the chart, which is what I want. Um, if I was a little bit bolder, I could probably dilute it with a bit more water to gain more coolant out of it. But here up in Canada, it gets really cold and it can get really hot. So I figured I'm going to make a 60-40 or so rough solution. We can remove the radiator cap off of the uh, cooling system and then basically begin filling the coolant reserve tank with my 60-40 or so coolant mixture. And on this BMW 330XI, if I remember correctly, it takes roughly six liters or so of um, coolant. So we'll just keep filling it until no more coolant will go in. Continue filling coolant as it slowly fills up the engine block and radiator assembly. Now, um, we haven't technically reattached the drive belts on this vehicle just yet, so um, I've actually only been able to fill in about two liters of this coolant mixture so far. So, um, anyways, that's essentially the process of how you fill coolant. BMW makes a really neat little nifty uh, float stick here uh, on this assembly, and basically, once this pops up, it means that this reservoir is completely filled with the engine coal, as it's called or cold. If it's at this level here, it means that the coolant level is at its minimum in the vehicle it's a reservoir. If it's at the top, that means this reservoir is filled. But the struggle here is that we can't actually add any more coolant into this car until we reassemble the drive belt. So let's go ahead and do that and then uh, top off the coolant. So to reinstall the belt, we need to roughly route the belt in the manner that it's supposed to go in and then ever so carefully release the tension on our tensioner to basically allow us to thread the uh, belt back over onto the alternator pulley. Um, it always pays attention or it always helps to make sure that you do a rough diagram of what your belts look like. I'm not really sure how well you can see how I'm doing all of this, but in a nutshell, um, that hydraulic tensioner, if you apply gentle pressure to it, it does give way and then you can uh, reattach everything. So I put everything back in for the serpentine belt which is driving the alternator and power steering and then of course the final step is to install this dust cap back over our tensioner uh, pulley assembly so that dust and dirt and water doesn't get in there to uh, ruin that pulley. Give it a firm, firm push around the perimeter of it so it snaps properly into place and then we'll now proceed to move on to installing the AC belt. So I've done a rough looping of my air conditioning belt assembly and so now uh, basically in a nutshell I'm going to try to again use my T50 bit putting it squarely into that Torx bolt in the middle of the tensioner to ever so slightly move this tensioner out of the way so that I can loop my AC compressor belt back onto the uh, crankshaft pulley. Now whenever you're installing belts, it's also a good idea to pay attention to make sure that the belt routes around all the pulleys properly because the other thing that could happen is 
if the belts are eroded and they're off the grooves on the pulley, as like how my AC belt is right now on the compressor, the moment you start the car and it goes off track, you're going to do some serious damage to your vehicle. So pay attention. Use your hands, feel around, make sure everything lines up properly. And then once everything is good, it should line up and we should be golden at this stage. Don't forget, reinstall your little dust cap down here onto the AC tensioner. Double check everything, make sure there's no tools down there. That should be good. Next, we want to reinstall the radiator fan assembly back into the engine bay. And we're going to do that by ever so carefully sliding this down into the engine bay until that little tab in the bottom pushes into the lower latch and then reinstall a little radiator pop rivet and if everything lines up properly then it should be no problem which no issue and then we want to reinstall our T25 torque screw and just hand tighten that back on so that the radiator fan stays into place Hand tight guys, don't have to be too tight. Then, what we need to do next is we want to loop this little wire hoop back around that uh, lower hook that I mentioned earlier when we were taking this fan assembly out. And once we have that loop through, we can then reattach this radiator fan control connector. We can grab our little fan control solenoid. We can hook that back on in this manner and then snap that into place and then reconnect the little pigtail connector on it as such. Make sure everything is nice and firm and secure. And the next step is to reinstall the air cleaner box. To reinstall the air cleaner box, make sure that the mass airflow sensor connector is above the engine bay. Make sure that you have no tools down in the engine bay area. And then at a slight angle, we want to put this snorkel piece back down into the engine compartment as such. And then we're just going to have to kind of fish around here to get that piece to go back in while at the same time getting our intake hose all to fall back into place properly. And how you'll know that everything fits together, right, is that the two screw holes here for the air cleaner will line up perfectly. And of course the hose and everything else will just sort of come together uh, nice and smoothly. Make sure that the air hose snorkel is completely attached perfectly onto the air cleaner box, making sure that there's no gaps and you might have to push down on it just a little bit so that it lines up while you tighten the clamp down. And using your flathead screwdriver, hand tighten the clamp to secure the hose. You don't need to tighten this too much, just hand tight is sufficient. You don't want to break this air box. Next, we can replace the two 10 millimeter bolts to hold this air cleaner assembly to the frame of the vehicle. Just hand tight again, as such. You can now take this wiring harness here and hook that back onto the little hook on the back side of the air cleaner assembly. And this pushes on. And then taking this wiring harness assembly, you can Either choose to just plug it in through the top like I've seen a lot of people do or you can come underneath the air box as such like this and just plug that in and there you have it. We now want to reattach the intake air dam snorkel assembly by sliding 
this piece into the snorkel. I'm just carefully wiggling it until everything lines up properly. And then reinstall the three pop rivets that we had removed early on in this tutorial. And they just simply go back in like this, push down, this, push down, and our last one, number three, right here. Now if these don't push down, you can always use something just to tap those down. So one of the final stage steps that we need to do is make sure that we inspect the entire engine bay area as well as check all of our fluid levels prior to starting our vehicle. Um, and then once the vehicle is running, we can then proceed to go ahead and add additional coolant to the cooling system. Um, I've double checked the windshield cowl area in here to make sure there's no nuts and bolts. I've checked the cabin air filter region in case something fell down. I've checked the ABS pump region as well as the brake fluid reservoir area and everything in between. And so everything looks okay, so let's fire this bad boy up and top off the coolant. Upon starting the vehicle, make sure that we turn the heater on the highest heat and fan setting. And then proceed to add coolant into our cooling system. Now right now, based on this reservoir, it is still quite high. But one thing that we want to do now is actually open up the upper radiator bleed screw, which is right here. And when you open it up, you'll begin to see coolant dropping down in the reservoir. And that's really important because as we continue to fill the radiator with coolant, it's going to keep uptaking more and more and more and more into the engine. So we've opened up that bleed hole that will allow air to escape from the supposed highest point in the cooling system. As you can tell, we've only put in maybe two liters of coolant so far. Feel free to just keep pouring and pouring and pouring and adding more and more coolant until the system takes it all in. Continue filling coolant until coolant begins to continuously come out of that little bleed screw. In total, it should be approximately six liters or so of coolant in this vehicle. And so, to ensure that this is completely filled, I'm going to continue adding coolant until I know I can see a fairly steady stream of water coming out of that, uh, out of that bleed screw there. Not sure how well you can see that, but it's coming out now steadily. And it's just that little bleeder is just right there, guys. Now you might want to put a drain pan underneath the vehicle just to catch any excessive coolant that is going to be dribbling out onto your garage floor, but I pretty much am just letting nature take its course. And as it's dribbling and as your funnel level goes down, you can go ahead and re-tighten that down hand tight as such and remove your funnel. And then basically at this point, just replace, you can see that this is floating above saying it's at max cold. And then just screwing this rad cap back on in the interim. Now, presumably the cooling system should be full at this point, but I have seen instances where there are air bubbles within the cooling system. And what happens is that only time will tell uh, when you're gonna need to add more coolant. But you can essentially start driving your vehicle at this point and then uh, just making sure that your heater's on high the whole time so that you're pushing water and the air out of the heater core. And then on top of that, uh, what happens is that you'll find that every morning when the engine's cooled off and you take this cap off, that the coolant level will be low. And what you want to do is you want to keep adding coolant and keep adding coolant over the course of a day or two until this is full. And then what you'll find is that as the engine heats up, excessive coolant will get pushed out of this reservoir onto the ground. Now just pay attention to where the coolant is coming from, uh, but for the most part, if everything was done right, uh, you should be feeling heat in the vehicle, your water pump shouldn't be making any funny noises, and, uh, your, and your car shouldn't be leaking any coolant you know, during the normal course of idling unless it's coming from the uh, reserve tank overflow.
One other service tip here, guys, is that under no circumstances should you ever open that radiator cap when the engine is even warm or hot. The last thing you want to do is depressurize the system when there's a lot of hot steam inside the motor, um, as that it can come out scalding you and burning you because of the extreme temperature of the engine. As you can tell, doing the water pump and thermostat assembly isn't extremely difficult, but rather more time consuming than anything. Uh, to perform this procedure requires a certain element of patience, as well as a methodical method on how to dismantle the entire front end of the engine. Now, on this particular vehicle, because it's a manual transmission, it's actually, in fact, a little bit easier than if you had a 3 Series that was an automatic. Uh, because of the fan clutch assembly issue. But in this case, we didn't run into any major snags. It took a couple hours to do, and we all managed to actually replace the water pump, thermostat assembly, as well as all the coolant inside the motor. Um, so again, you know, by comparison, if you took this work to BMW, it would easily cost you several hundred, if not nearly a thousand dollars to conduct this work. Whereas here, you know, it's more of your own personal time, the cost of parts, and, uh, and a little bit of logical know-how in doing so. I hope you found this video useful and informative. Rate, comment, and subscribe.